60 Years of the Space Age, Part 4, From the Ashes. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. You are now tuned in to Science Epics, 60 Years of the Space Age. Hello there, and welcome back to 60 Years of the Space Age, an internet podcast series where we tell the story of the human presence in outer space starting from Sputnik until the current day, in commemoration of the launch of Sputnik 60 years ago in 1957. The world had changed forever after World War II, the effects of which are still felt today. We tend to forget how a lot of the world we live in right now is shaped largely by those events that happened 70 years ago. The invention of the radar, computers, jet engines, and McDonald's all had their origins from that period in time between 1939 and 1945. The invention of the rocket in its present form is one of those things that came out of the Second World War. Here in my home country of Malaysia, we had a large part of our modern history shaped by the Japanese invasion of Malaya on December 8, 1941. Just one day after the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese army landed at a place called Kota Baru, Kelantan, on the east coast of Malaya, defeating the British Indian army from there all the way to Singapore, and they did it, historically enough, using a bicycle blitzkrieg using soldiers mounted on bicycles to move troops and supplies from their initial landing site at the beaches down to the southern tip of the country. And they occupied Malaya from 1942 until the end of the war in 1945 when the bombs dropped, leaving behind a legacy of nationalism and an exhausted British Empire, unable to hold back the Malayan march towards independence. Surprise, surprise, it's actually Independence Month for Malaysia right now, in August as I'm recording this, so it's not just the space age that's turning 60 this year. Malaysia turned 60 as well. Malaysia got its independence from Britain in August 1957, and Sputnik, the first man-made object in space, was launched in October 1957, the two events taking place hardly a month apart from each other. But anyway, back to our story. When the Second World War ended, and the dust began to settle in the ruins of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Humanity aimed to rebuild. It was the end of one era, and clearly the beginning of another, just in time for the whole world to look up at the stars for new horizons and a new hope. From the ashes came the space age. Following the war, and even before the lines on the globe were redrawn into the two halves that would dominate the Cold War and the race to the moon, Soviet Russia and America were already involved in a new struggle involving secret teams of soldiers in the ruins of Nazi Germany. A secret contest involving Soviet Russia and the United States in the devastated German heartland. The hunt was on to acquire what was left of Werner von Braun's V-2, <laughs> excuse me, A-4 rockets. The name V-2, or Vergeltungswaffe 2, refers to the name Adolf Hitler gave it to use as a vengeance weapon against his enemies. Its inventors never wanted that. The original engineering designation of the world's first ever guided rocket was the A-4, or in German, Aggregat 4 the word aggregate referring to a collection of parts and machinery working together to accomplish a certain task. This task could either be going to space or bombing the life out of cities. Take your pick. I'd rather we use them to explore space. You see, rocket technology was used in one way or another during the war by both Allied and Axis powers. Most of it was dumb fire and forget weapons that couldn't be controlled. And before the war, both the Russians and the Germans had made great strides in the field of rocketry, driven by curious individuals that wanted to use these new machines as means of reaching other worlds. But Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin, having put Sergei Korolev and his associates in jail, ultimately delayed Russian progress and allowed Germany to take the lead. And with the war over and Nazi Germany in ruins, there was nothing standing between the winners and the search and acquisition of what remained of these precious rockets and the geniuses that had built them. 
So the race was on. But why such enthusiasm for the German-built rockets? Why was the V-2 of such interest to the Russians and Americans that they tried so hard to capture them? A liquid-fueled guided rocket, keywords here being liquid-fueled and guided, like the one invented by von Braun, was the holy grail of that search. Such a rocket, if refined, upgraded, and fine-tuned, could somehow allow you to deliver a munitions payload or a sizable BOOM to anywhere on the planet. Contrary to the opinion of Adolf Hitler, it wasn't just an artillery shell with a longer range and a much higher cost. It was to be the instrument of mankind's escape to the heavens. And also possibly the bringer of ultimate hell. And the winners of the last war, the Americans and the Soviet Union, knew that whoever controlled such technology would have a leg up in the strategic Game of Thrones of the coming era. And the name of that game was to capture as many German rocket scientists as possible, and to capture what remained of the V-2 rockets themselves. You could imagine the situation as something like that toy that kids in the 90s used to play with, called Hungry Hungry Hippos, where you had this little plastic hippo you could use to open and close its mouth, and the aim of the game was to gobble up as many little balls inside this little plastic bowl thing. Well, it's something like that. If you know that game, then good on you. You had a great childhood. If you don't know that game, then Google it, and you'll soon see the connection. It's like Hungry Hungry Hippos, except the hippos were armed soldiers, and the little balls were German V2 rockets and rocket scientists. Phew, those, those are good times. Good times. The stakes at risk in this game of gobble gobble German scientists was the balance of power in the coming Cold War, the future of the space race, and the destiny of humanity's journey to other worlds. That's quite a lot hanging in the balance. You don't get a more epic struggle than that. Except on Sunday night when Game of Thrones comes out. <laughs> and this shadow war for Germany's rockets was done presumably under the guise of peace. One war had just ended and the bones of the dead were not even cold yet. And they were already planning contingencies for the next one. It was this atmosphere of paranoia, this keep your friends close and your potential enemies closer type of situation that the stirrings of the space age was born. So the Americans had their hungry hippo, they called it Operation Paperclip. And the Soviets had their hungry hippo called Operation Oswavyakim. Oswavyakim, something like that. If you're Russian, please do correct me. Both aimed at either willingly or forcibly taking German scientists and technical specialists, then making them work for their respective governments, as well as to capture samples of the V2A4 rockets themselves. There was a list of high-profiled individuals called the Ozenberg List. Sort of like a most wanted list, but instead of criminals, it had scientists on them. It detailed the names of several German scientists that were in service to the Nazi regime during the war. Not all of them had drunk deeply into the Nazi Kool-Aid. They weren't all hardcore national socialists. They weren't all part of the, hit, the cult of Hitler, but they had done their part to develop cutting-edge technology, never before seen cutting-edge technology, for one of the most evil institutions in human history. Now, chief among the names on that list was Werner von Braun. His brother Magnus von Braun was on it as well, as well as General Dr. Walter Dornberger, characters we introduced in the previous two episodes. It's sort of like those old spy movies, like James Bond where the hero had to rescue the scientist with important secrets and information vital to national security. Except this story actually played out in real life. It actually just happened. These things happened when it's dark out after World War II. And those fictional stories were probably influenced by this very much real one. The author of the James Bond series, Ian Fleming, definitely took his experience from World War II as inspiration for his books. Just another phenomenon in our present time influenced by World War II. Anyway, 
The Americans really managed to luck out in this struggle when they captured a living, breathing von Braun and much of his accompanying staff, despite his past as a Nazi scientist. I mean, the dude actually wore the SS uniform. Von Braun was actually very much eager and willing to cooperate with the Americans, expecting another high-profile life as a top scientist and all the shiny new toys to play with, all of which would come in time for Von Braun, but not as easily as he initially expected it. He would have to sing for his supper, and we'll go into his exploits in the following episodes. It will be a story of redemption for him. In September 1945, less than a month after Japan had surrendered, remember, Germany was defeated in April, while Japan stood defiant for some more months longer than that, Von Braun and his team, along with some of their family members, were picked up from Germany and flown to the US, where they would all later play a pivotal role in the American space program. The Russians managed to capture about as many German scientists as the, as the Americans, although they did not get such a high prize as the Werner von Braun. They did manage to capture Helmut Grotrup, who had worked alongside von Braun at Pinemunde as a program manager for the design of the V2 guidance systems. The role of these scientists in the coming space age would be less active. The Russians took their prize, brain drained them by having them debrief their own scientists with their knowledge, Sergei Korolev being one of the chief interrogators, and then after all the knowledge was in Russian hands, or should I say brains, the scientists were sent packing back to their homes in Germany, that was at the time being jointly governed by the Allied powers. All of it was done under quite civil conditions actually, there was no torture, no abuse, no violence, the Germans captured by the Russians were given modest and decent living conditions while under captivity just that they weren't given any hands-on work with the actual rockets themselves. Fair enough. I guess the world had had its fill of violence after the Second World War. And when you think about the atrocities the Germans had conducted on the Russians and vice versa, all the inhumanity that had played out on the battlefields of the Eastern Front, the captured German scientists were lucky enough to get that kind of treatment. As for the remnants of the V2, much of the march into space in the years after World War II involved making modifications to the original von Braun design, making it fly harder, better, faster, stronger, as Daft Punk put it. The Russians had the leg up in this. They were geographically closer to Germany and to the Pinemunde and Mittelwerk facilities, meaning they could much more easily get samples of V2s and study their launch sites. Immediately after the war in Europe, Sergei Korolev and Valentin Glushko, the frenemies that we talked about in the last episode, did tours of the V2 rocket factories and their launch sites, studying what was left of von Braun's work. The Russians were later able to build their own modified V2s that would eventually turn into the R series of rockets, a rocket design that would truly stand the test of time. For all the innovation of the V2 during the war, it suffered from some reliability issues, and the Russian versions were able to double the range of the original German rockets. And now they had a rocket that could fly all the way from Russia to Britain, and this happened as the clock turned to half past on the 20th century in 1950. It was now time for the first decade of the space age. Humanity was now in possession of these machines turned weapons that had come of age in the last few decades. Rockets, once the thing of fantasy and dreams, were now working machines that could be flown to a certain degree of reliability. They would be used for the next 60 years to carry the sum of humanity's hopes and dreams to the stars and also to drape a shadow of potential ruin across the globe. This is where the fun begins. But most importantly, these technologies would move from the realm of military secrecy into the eyes of the public, into the eyes of normal, everyday, ordinary people, where they would truly become the obsession of an entire generation and the carrier of one man's ascension to the realm of legend. This has been Science Epics, 60 Years of the Space Age. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Skirt.